Good morning, good day, and greetings. How are you? Welcome to Tucson, uh, Tucson Transportation Talks. My name is uh, Slick from Tech Talk Radio, as well as being a street ambassador with Move Tucson. If you're writing me a check, though, it's Michael Edmonds. Hi. Um, this year's conference theme, are we there yet? And uh, we're bringing in Terry White. Uh, I'm going to do the introduction, and then Terry will have a presentation for you. Let's see what I know about Terry. Terry began his Metro career in 1987, has served as a transportation planner, customer service administrator, communication superintendent, and managing director of bus operations. There's more. Uh, he's previously deputy general manager, overseeing all Metro operations across bus, rail, and marine services, facilities, and vehicle maintenance. Currently, the general manager of King County, the Puget Sound region's largest public transportation agency, and that's Puget Sound uh, along the, uh, the coast of the great state of Washington. Prior to uh, COVID-19, Metro delivered more than 400,000 trips every weekday, 400,000, and roughly half of downtown Seattle commuters relied on transit. Metro provides bus, van pool, water taxi services, operates Seattle streetcar, the Sound Transit Link light rail and Sound Transit Express bus service. Boy, that's, I couldn't say that fast three times. Ladies and gentlemen, Terry White. Hey, Mike, can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. Well, let's get started. Good morning to you and to everyone. Happy Thursday. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to say how appreciative I am of this opportunity to engage with all of you today. Uh, really, there's only one thing that would have made this even more appreciative is if I could have gotten out of this uh, rainy, overcast Seattle, Washington area weather uh, that happens here in March and joined you all down in bright and sunny Tucson. Uh, that would have been the experience for me in person. Uh, and trust me, I did check your weekly weather forecast just to see what I was missing. Uh, but with that being said, given the events that have impacted the world to the point of where we are virtually in 2021, uh, I believe that now is a pivotal moment to be a transit provider. And it's the perfect time for this conversation, even if we have to do it at a distance. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, next slide. Now is important because mobility is a human right. I love the theme that you have for this year's conference, Are We There Yet? I have five kids aged from 30 down to 12. And what I've learned over the 30 years of child rearing is that when it comes to having fun, and at least with one of my kids, we're operating in the future and struggling to embrace the current moment. In car rides, someone is always saying, are we there yet? Now, as a tradition, once a year, my wife and I take our kids and we do this multimodal trip that involves light rail to water taxi to micro transit to fixed bus and then back. Uh, our quest is to visit West Seattle, have some lunch, do some shopping and visit a popular beach in the area. Now, no matter what exciting thing we're actually doing, at least one of my kids will always exclaim halfway through the journey how incredibly fun it is, but then quickly follow with, where are we going next? And for my family, are we there yet is very interchangeable with where are we going next? And this to me is transit. This transit can never completely say that we have arrived. At King County Metro, we prioritize equity in order to serve those with the greatest need to move from a place to a place. Said another way, from there to there. And when it comes to mobility, there is not a physical address. There can be socioeconomic. There is one's position within the social status. There is a distant condition. There is a state of mind, there can be a bunch of things. And for these reasons, when it comes to transit, there must also be continually evolving. And this is absolutely the most important time ever for mobility. And that is not an exaggeration, nor is it hyperbole. 
Consider with me my three-part reasoning. Next slide. First, the pandemic has revealed to everyone that many of us, what we have always known, when it comes to mobility, transit is not an option, it is a necessity. It is a necessity for essential workers and to those needing transit to access groceries and medical needs. And many of our current riders have never left the transit system, even when faced with strong recommendations from organizations like the CDC, public health to stay home, if that was an option for you. Current riders that are riding with us do not have that option. And in order to keep their lights on, transit is their only way. But beyond this, transit is a necessity to all of us. Without employees taking transit, the lights go dark, the store shelves go bare, our hospitals do not get cleaned and sanitized and they cease to function safely. To many positive responses, the many, many positive responses to transit to this pandemic simply wouldn't have happened without transit providing its mobility. There is also this moral imperative that exists for many people that are challenged by lower incomes, fewer resources, disabilities, age. And for them, transit is the lifeline. So transit was revealed to be the pandemic to be a necessity. And this brings me to my second reason for why now is so critical. Next slide. The pandemic also exposed transit's weakness. And unlike COVID-19, our issues will not be solved by vaccines. Transit's weakness is an over-reliance on fares and volatile funding structures. While transit systems vary widely in how much they count on fares, no system is truly immune. Now I am optimistic and very much on the record in my belief that in-person work We'll, we'll bounce back in a very big way, but we should make no mistake, the percentage of employees on site on any given day will never be quite as high as it was in a pre-COVID 2019 environment. Of course, during this pandemic, other revenue streams such as taxes are also struggling and our customers are ill-equipped to make up that difference. So to sum it up so far, it's never been clear that the health of our economy and our society are reliant on the health of our transit systems. And yet our revenues will take years to get back to 2019 levels unless we begin to change our funding models. This brings me to part three of my reasoning. Next slide. Because of the need for mobility, along with this funding conundrum, all of the big decisions are on the table facing us right now. Growth is virtuous, it's good. And worthy growth means more movement. But in recessions, transit tends to think cut, cut frequency, cut service hours per day, cut routes for those who need transit the most, cancel capital projects, cut investments into learning how to become more efficient and effective. But we in transit know that a small funding plan leads to a fewer buses, fewer riders, fewer fares, leading to a smaller funding, fewer buses, you get the idea. That's the vicious cycle. This inflection point of 2021 for many of us begins a make or break period for transit to demonstrate its value to riders and voters. And that demonstration can lead to increased funding increased investment, increased ridership. And that is the virtuous cycle. Next slide. Now, while others are talking about shrinking the pie, it's on us as leaders not to follow and to instead describe a different vision for transit. Dr. King once said that any cause, any movement is doomed unless it paints a positive vision that people can see themselves in. We must paint that vision and show what is possible with transit. 
Now I'm here with you today making this proclamation while at the very same moment, King County Metro has had to suspend some service and even more unfortunately, we've had to encourage some employees to take voluntary retirement. And we've had to lay off some of our part-time operators. Still, we made these decisions with an eye towards what we call our long game, our Metro Connects vision of regional, fast, frequent, all day reliable service. And we're moving toward how we emerge stronger in the next six months, 24 months, five years and beyond. Today, I, I wanna share just a few pivotal projects that I'm pleased to say that we are moving ahead with. Now, much of these were core to Metro prior to this pandemic, and they have guided us well throughout this response period and towards the recovery phase. In some cases, the pandemic shook us out of an old model that we might have never otherwise abandoned. Many of these efforts speak to our organizational core values of safety, equity, and sustainability. Next slide. First, and most important, we are using equity to guide how we engage in planning and delivering service. Partnering with community members has to be just as important as the work we do with elected officials, governmental jurisdictions, and big businesses. And our engagement is now focused on searching for and listening to the value that our partners bring to the potential service footprint. Instead of showing up with a fully cooked meal, we work harder to understand community needs and invite them to help prepare the meal. While King County Metro is actively engaging the communities that we serve through traditional town halls and surveys, we're also working hard to ensure that we're hearing the voices of those that have been traditionally marginalized in silence. We see these as communities with greater needs and everyone deserves a seat at the table. So we are asking ourselves, how well does our system serve these five areas of vulnerable population? Black, indigenous, people of color communities, communities with low and no income, foreign born and refugee communities, communities where English is not the primary language and disabled communities. We're asking who is speaking for these folks, these communities. At Metro, we have engaged the services of an equity cabinet that includes 25 community leaders that represent low income, black, native, communities of color, immigrants, refugees, limited English speaking people and people with disabilities. The group meets regularly and helps to co-create our mobility framework. And they continue to meet monthly in online meetings to discuss and provide feedback on proposed updates to Metro's policies. They help us ensure that all voices are being heard. And we're paying this team because we truly value their input into how we deliver service. Next slide. We have stepped up our safe and reliable game. From twice a year service changes, we were able to move to frequent service adjustments. Now, this is something we struggled with initially and then got pretty good at. We are driving, we are giving our drivers out of a capacity bus issue, the ability to request an additional bus that we monitor, that we input for operators so that we can expand and contract service in real time. In this pandemic moment, this is allowing us to better serve and be more responsive to our customers. Next slide. Travel patterns are changing. We are listening, actively learning that our transit system can no longer be a hub and spoke service primarily designed for mobility to and from Seattle's downtown central business district. Nor can travel be overly focused on this weekday nine to five commute pattern. We are now envisioning a web inspired connected system that provides a true regional service network, a 
a system that provides more direct and frequent service between locations and communities that are not downtown. We plan to do this through future bus rapid transit lines. Next slide. I said this, mobility is a human right. To this end, we do not want fares to be the barrier to getting there. That's why we're providing discounted fare passes for seniors, for youth, and customers with disabilities or low incomes. And we are not done. In the fall of 2020, we launched a fully subsidized pass for customers with very low incomes at or below 80% of the federal poverty level. And by partnering with several existing government programs that already exist, we are piggyback, piggybacking on active verification methods while also saving county residents the need to apply for yet another program. On top of this, we have also removed the judicial system from fare collection and now are providing alternative pathways for people who can't afford the fare. We know that a person that can't afford a $3 bus ticket also cannot afford a hefty $124 fine. Next slide. We're also investing in zero emission buses. This aligns with our commitment to having a 100% zero emission fleet by 2040 or sooner. We have our first installment of long range battery electric buses arriving later this spring. While we have seven bases across the county, we are intentionally putting the first charging stations at our south base in order to help improve the air quality for surrounding south end communities that have poor overall air quality and are also predominantly people of color. Prior to the pandemic, transit was already taking the equivalent of 190,000 cars off the road per day in King County and Seattle. And zero emission buses will make us even greener. Slide three. First mile, last mile innovations. For some communities, the solution can't be and is not always fixed route bus. We're running pilots like Via to Transit and Crossroads Connect, this transit on demand that can be accessed with an app or a phone call. Our access paratransit being flexible and responsive has helped to provide services during the pandemic uh, and contributes to our agency helping in food bank distribution and providing service trips to vaccination sites. Now I'm asking you, what else can we do? What can all of us do? And I'm asking why must transit continue to push to get there? Because we know that transit is a life changer. It is a game changer for really those communities that are vulnerable, those marginalized and those silent. Uh, I can only think of a way if, if we were to bring this home, uh, perhaps a real life story can help us with why we do what we do. Next slide. Take a look at this little guy here. Uh, now I must say, I was a very handsome kid at, at that age and I thought the world was my oyster. Uh, this is me. This is me in I believe preschool, a preschool environment. Now, I was not keenly interested in mobility as a career at this age, but I appear to be interested in creating my own little mobility agency there. Next slide. So uh, I guess a closer look, you can clearly see that I didn't quite have a handle on how mobility modes might work together. Uh, looks like that's me trying to insert a train into the uh, dump truck. Uh, but here's the thing. No matter how closely you look at what I am doing in this picture, what you can't see in this picture is my journey to my there, which ultimately brings me to being here with you today. Next slide. So here's my journey. I was raised by my single parent mom born in Guthrie, Oklahoma. She was the 13th of 13 children. 
Most of her siblings did not even attend high school and none graduated. When my mom was two years old, she contracted polio. And that illness left her with motor skill challenges that caused an inability for her to use her right hand. And she had physical challenges off and on with the right side of her body. So for me, my brother, and my sister, we were raised in a Seattle public housing project at the address of 4217 Hammerack Drive South. The place we were raised was so beneath acceptable standards that it and that address no longer exist. Now talk about being a part of a vulnerable population. Black, disabled, poor. Because my mother worked so hard to give us what she believed other families were receiving, it took me a bit of time to realize that we weren't poor. I began to notice things that brought it more to my attention. My mom used to volunteer at this downtown food bank where she would help to feed homeless and package groceries for those in need. Eventually, I noticed that we were also taking some of those bags of groceries home with us at the end of the night. It took me a minute, but I started to realize what that meant. Next slide. Because of my mom's disability, we grew up without a car, but this didn't stop her from giving us the life experiences and culture that she believed everyone else had access to. To do this, our mobility was Metro Transit. And I'm telling you, we went everywhere on the bus, the grocery store, zoo, museums, music lessons, the state fair, and church to name several. Can you go back to the previous slide? This is a picture of, of me and my brother and my mom, and we're headed to church. I know you're probably thinking, well, who takes pictures of a regular occurrence of going to church? This just happens to be uh, a couple of outfits that my mom handmade for us. Uh, so she was very proudly showing us off. I don't know if I like the outfit or not, but I'm pretty sure my sister is the one taking the picture here. And by the time I reached the fourth grade, my mom began to consider what I would need in the form of an education to fulfill what she thought was my destiny. She had absolutely no faith in the elementary and junior high school that served in our redlined neighborhood. She heard about a new open concept public school that was opening in the fall and began to create a diabolical plan to get me into this school, even though it wasn't in my district. Uh, she told me, I don't even know if this thing is really gonna work out, but I believe that the teachers who are gonna be there are gonna work their tails off to make it a success, at least for the years that you will be there. Now, her master plan was to catch a bus down to Seattle Public Schools, demand a meeting with the superintendent of the school system and sit in that lobby until they would give her that meeting. And it worked. And they gave in to her demand, and I vividly remember her, her coming out of that meeting and saying, okay, you are in, but here's the deal. They're going to make me get you there, and I can't because I don't have a car and I have to work. So she told me then that you can do this because you've been riding Metro with me forever. You just have to do it alone, and it'll be okay. You just have to sit up front make some eye contact with that bus driver. They will take care of you. You will be fine. This is going to work out. And she was right. I got on that bus. I was scared. I was nervous. Never taken a bus by myself. I sat up front. I made eye contact with that bus driver. And the trip was fun. A week in, the bus driver asked me, why was I, this little guy, taking this trip to this school when there was one around the corner from me? And I explained kind of quickly my mother's wishes and the operator kind of nodded uh, and went on about his day. And a couple of days later, the operator said, hey, since you're doing this with me, how about you help me with my signage? Uh, I have to head back towards town after I drop you at this last spot on the route. Uh, if you'll do this, I'll let you keep your 20 cents. Now I'm from the projects. We don't have a lot. I needed that 20 cents. So I took that deal 
and I helped that operator work the signage. Now, back then, this is how you work signage. You had to roll that screen. Uh, but I proudly got on that bus, had my backpack, kept my 20 cents, felt good about my wherewithal in life. This was great. Uh, I was a part of the system. And then I began to learn about transit and service changes and how an operator might leave you for another route. Uh, and as this operator was explaining this thing to me, I got fearful all over again. And this operator told me something that was very impactful. He said he hung out in this pit room and he waited to find who was going to do the route that he had given up. And he told that person all about me and my needs. That's transit. Now I was nervous, I'm going back out. The operator had assured me it'll be okay, it'll be a seamless transition, but I wasn't sure about that. So I got on this bus and this new operator says, hey, welcome. I know all about you, no issues, no problems. You keep doing your job, you keep your 20 cents. Life is good, welcome, good, good to see you. And immediately I was back to, wow, this is, this is incredible, this is great, I did my job. And at the end of the line, remember now I'm a 10 year old, I asked this operator or I exclaimed to the operator, I said, hey, did you know that the other operator used to buy me breakfast in the morning? And that operator kind of chuckled. Remember, I'm 10. This is what 10 year olds do. But here's the surprising thing. From that day on, that operator bought me breakfast every morning. And it was then that I knew I needed to get to transit somehow. As a 10 year old, I came home and I told my mother, I need one of those buses. I gotta get in on this. I wanna be a part of a community that cares, that loves, that is getting people from a place to a place. And for some of us, that place was not physical. I did everything I could from that day, gearing myself towards getting to Metro and getting myself one of those buses. And you fast forward to high school, and once again, my mother demanded that I go to a different school than the one I was supposed to. Once again, the Seattle school said, fine, but you gotta get him there. And my Metro journey continued again from South Seattle all the way to North Seattle. But it was worth it in the end. I got that education. I went on to college. I graduated from college. I came home and I quickly applied for every Metro job that was available. And I remember distinctly getting that phone call and being offered the operator position. Would you like to come down and interview? And I was very excited. I put my tie on and I came down, took my interview and Partially through the interview, I realized none of these questions seemed to have anything to do with driving a bus. So I looked down and realized that I was interviewing for a telephone operator. And I did everything I could to keep my composure in my face because I wanted any job that I could get. I figured eventually I'd get around to bus operations. I would get there sooner or later. It actually took me over 20 years. But 12 jobs plus later, here I, am, here I am with you all today. And if not for a transit system and a mother that pushed, that allowed, that shared, that moved, I don't get to be here with you all today. Uh, next slide. From 4217 Tamarack to all of what King County had to offer, including school, to watching my mother rise out of poverty, poverty and overcoming disabilities, to creating families where all of the children can obtain diplomas and graduate degrees. My mom was really always right. Transit makes mobility, education and careers possible on a daily basis. Next slide. I lost my mom in 2015, but I like to think she still rides with me as I even to this day continue to use the Metro Transit bus system to get to work. To get to work. The ability to move from there to there is game changing and mobility has to remain a human right. And I wanna thank each of you for your role that you're playing in transit in making that mobility possible 
And I encourage you all to continue to seek getting there in spite of what we are facing right now in the here. Uh, appreciate you all and thank you for your time. It's Terry Wright, General Manager of King County Metro. I thought it was, I said King County, I meant King County Metro as in Metropolitan Transportation Service. Is that right, Terry? Did, did I get it? Am I you got it up, you got it right. Okay, we're gonna do a little Q and A here and I've got, to, I'm gonna to try to get to the questions that have been submitted. And uh, I, by the way, Terry, I think my mom had the same pattern. Uh, she made a little adjustments in my outfit, but, but I think she had the same pattern. So, I'm just saying, you know, um, let's see. First question. Uh, how have you managed to pay people who serve on the equity cabinet? This is a question I was going to, I was hoping to ask you myself. This is a challenge we face as a government entity. Terry. Uh, we kind of piggybacked on a program that was being run for our roads and parks. So they did a lot of digging and they got some laws legally changed in the county. And then we showed up and said, hey, since you guys have done all the hard work, we would like to take half of your team so that we have this existing body. Now we're gonna ask them to focus on transit. So this equity team was in existence. Uh, our parks and roads did some work legally to make it so that we could compensate them. Uh, when we pulled it over into transit, the way we did it is we created a, uh, um, a secondary company that was helping us with our marketing program and they pay them. Okay, all right. Um, let me get to another question real quick before, cause I wanna, the people were, were <laughs> they really wanna know some things here. Um, here's one, this is, this is a fantastic keynote. Thank you to you, Terry. Will a recording be available? Do you know? No idea. I'm in the witness protection program, though, so I hope, hope no. Yes, it will. <laughs> oh, this is the super right. moderator there, my friend Gabriella. Uh, and so, uh, do you want to tell them about a little bit about how the, to watch later, Gabriella? Sure. Yeah, all the recordings will be available and presentations on our website. You just Google Tucson Transportation Talks and on the event plan platform. Okay. Thank you. Let's see. Um, scrolling down through many questions here. All right, let's try this one. How do you assure that the emissions free buses are going to be using clean energy for recharge? And that just jumped off my screen. Hold on, let me go back. Instead of dirty waste, dirty waste nuclear power. That one caught me uh, unexpectedly. Um, also, can you speak more about the collapse expand service? which sounds like an efficient approach to bus service. I, I got to admit to you, Terry, I'm not sure I understand the first question. Do you? Do you know where they want to go with that? Uh, yeah, so clean air, electricity can be dirty and it can be clean the way it's uh, brought in. Uh, so we're working with uh, Seattle Utilities as well as the, there's another uh, entity that uh, serves the rest of the county. Uh, we're ahead of where we're bringing these coaches in to ensure that we are bringing in and utilizing clean energy. So probably a lot more detail than that, but we're ahead of that curve just to make sure that what we're util utilizing is clean and efficient. Okay, and collapse expand service, I'm, I, what is that? So, so that is a form of, um, initially when the pandemic happened, we started to uh, restrict the number of folks who can ride on our services. And we began to see heavy ridership in certain parts of the region uh, probably where our uh, vulnerable populations are living uh, versus some of the other areas. So when constricting services, we didn't want to leave folks on the streets anywhere. So we began to, uh, we created some devices on our coach where the operators could help us with when they were uh, hitting the full load. We started looking at that data and then we started uh, placing additional runs in the system. Uh, in some areas of our system, we were seeing less service need. So we began to do this thing in between service changes uh, where we were on the fly, adding service, contracting service. Uh, and again, I said, we had never done that before. We probably would have never even thought about it, but it is something that's inspiring us to think more about this, uh, this term advanced service management. Uh, and we're thinking about going to piloting some uh, headway type systems where we can actually then expand and contract 
uh, depending on the day, on the demand, and on the need, uh, guaranteeing maybe a certain level of headway that might improve even uh, depending on the availability of our resources. Okay. Here's one. Let's see. Um, to build a broad-based support for the growth of transit in the region, what did your agency, decision makers, and community do? I think the first thing what, what, what we started doing was, again, it goes back to that engagement. We're engaging all the time now. I am meeting with uh, legal jurisdictions, electeds. I go to the community meetings, and I also love engaging with our equity cabinet. Uh, and they are very active. Communities and our cabinets are very active and vocal with how the system should be grown. Uh, we're leveraging the moment. Uh, right now, we're saying you see the need for transit. So I'm saying it over and over. I'm talking about the current and what we have to do in this moment to sustain ourselves for the next couple of years. But we're also talking about what is needed to get to that vision of full mobility, frequent service all day that we know we are still going to need. We are acknowledging that travel patterns are probably changing uh, real time right around us, but we are gearing up to learn from that information. And as big as we are, we're trying to become flexible enough that we can adjust quicker to the needs of the region. So it's, it's a conversation that's happening. I would say the pandemic in some ways has helped us to speak to the the power and the need of transit. Okay, I'm going to ask for some assistance from my super moderator here. I'm looking for that particular question, but I can't find it. Would you be able to, to pose it to Terry for me, please? It's Gabriella, she's available. Sure, absolutely. We have a question in the chat that asks, what kind of plan is in place moving forward for mobility in regards to those with low to no vision for King County? as far as bus stops or light rail stops and stations go? I think for us, again, I'm gonna go back to the, the concept of a Metro Connects vision that provides all day frequent service for everyone and focusing on uh, priority populations which include folks with disabilities. So in addition to our equity cabinet, we actually have other cabinets that we meet with that are representative of community, including those with disabilities uh, blind as well. Uh, and as we are going through all of our processes, it's become important for us to share plans before they become solidified in how we build out a system, how it, uh, the modes connect, how is ease of use. Uh, we haven't always done that well. Uh, we're acknowledging that that piece had to change. And I think that's, that's really the way is in a lot of Times we're pushing our information out and saying, this is what we're thinking about doing in terms of our structure and planning. What say you uh, weighing in long before we get to the phases where this is actually being implemented. Um, got another question for you, Terry. Uh, let's see, you mentioned cost reduction measures, including layoffs as a result of the pandemic. Has the reduced revenue impacted financial obligations to consultants that are working for KCM? So, so, our layoffs came about, uh, as you mentioned in the opening, we provide services for the city of Seattle. We provide services, we run the operating for the streetcar for Seattle. We run some uh, buses for sound transit. We run their link uh, light rail. And uh, the impact of uh, funding in some ways came from uh, funds that were paid in initially for some of those other services not the counties uh, that we have budgeted for. So as a result of those funds not coming to us, we ended up having to lay off some operators and adjust. We actually had a, a save fund, a rainy day fund, if you will, for these types of situations. Uh, so while we reduce service, we're running right now at about 85% of what we would normally run. Uh, we're probably gonna up that here in this next uh, service change. Uh, but we're, we're geared towards this, we're going to need to go out for funding, a funding package. We kind of do that every four to six years anyway. Uh, we were close to doing that when the pandemic hit. So right now, I'm asking our team to focus on some key initiatives. We're going to deliver on those. Uh, and then we're setting ourselves up for the conversation that has to come 
with regards to regional growth and what a transit system needs to be. Uh, I have to say, I feel like we have more folks with us right now because they're understanding this need for mobility. We help with the congestion. So even the folks who don't ride public are benefiting from those of us who do. Okay. Um, we need to wrap up the Q&A, but I, I will say this before we go. Um, there, and there have been multiple comments in, in the, uh, the Q&A chat, but I want to read this one to you. And this is indicative of, of the military. Someone in Manchester, New Hampshire is crying with tears of joy listening to your life story. Thanks for brightening up a cold New Hampshire day. And there are multiple comments similar to that that have been submitted. Just want you to know. Well, I, I tell you, I'm very, I'm extremely appreciative. I, I know what transit does. And I know what a good foundation from a strong woman uh, can also do for you. Uh, you know, when I couldn't dream, uh, she dreamed for me. Uh, and when I didn't understand, I knew better to listen though. Uh, and in the end, uh, you know, I, I get emotional too still. So thank you for that. All right, I'll, I'll do one more. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a similar one that tags on it that says, very touched by this beloved, taking the bus to church and school life story. So you're, you're touching people, buddy. You're touching them. I still ride. I get peace from the ride. I prefer to ride. Uh, back then I had no choice. I'm a choice rider now. I choose to ride. That's me. Yep, I'm, I'm with you on that. So Terry White, general manager of King County Metro in the great state of Washington. Thank you, Terry. Appreciate you being here. Uh, oh let me uh, just let everybody know that. So we're going to take a 15 minute break here. Session three is going to start at 1030 and hopefully I haven't gone too long here. Uh, session three is we are burning up how shifting to transit and mobility options can save us. Thank you all for attending this um, and we'll see you back at the break at 1030.